The subject today is financial aid packages. Specifically, how students can better decode and truly understand the financial aid award letters they receive from institutions where they applied and have been accepted. Last year, I was fortunate enough to attend the National College Attainment Network Conference in Atlanta, where I sat in on a demonstration by MoneyThink, much like the one you're about to see. And it was electrifying, which I know sounds like a dramatization, but sincerely, it shifted my entire perspective. Some background, I have never had to sit with a student or 400 students individually to help them translate those letters that they get from colleges. And until that demonstration, it hadn't even occurred to me that the very good news, like financial aid award letter that students were receiving could be a barrier to entry. Luckily, the moment I discovered that problem, MoneyThink was there to share a solution. With that teaser of a tee up, allow me to introduce to you today's presenters, John and Hannah. The floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joan. It's great to be here. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, I wanted to actually kind of just start off by introducing uh, myself and my colleagues. So my name is Hannah Smith. Um, I oversee our partnerships work here at MoneyThink, um, and I, my background's in school counseling, so I come to this work of supporting advisors and counselors through that lens. And John, I'll hand it off to you to introduce yourself, too. Hey, everyone. My name is John Tamra. Um, I've been financial coach working with students directly and now supporting the advisors and programs looking to utilize our tools. Awesome. So today we, we have a couple of little like icebreaker things we'll do throughout. We're going to kind of overview who we are at MoneyThink and the work that we're doing. We'll talk a little bit more to Joan's point about this kind of problem that we're trying to solve with Decided, which is around college affordability. Um, in many ways, I know that we're preaching to the choir here because y'all are steeping in this day to day. Um, but we do want to kind of highlight some of the, the problems that we found in our coaching work and then how we've come up with the solution decided to solve some of those. Um, and we'll talk about decided. So John's going to do a demo of both the student and the advisor side. We'll talk about how you can get your account set up. And then, of, of course, you know, throughout and at certain points, we'll pause for questions. But I encourage you to use the chat. Um, we'll elevate some of those questions for the whole group where we think those are applicable, and then we might just end up chatting with you on the side to answer those if they're kind of very specific. But feel free to, to use the chat throughout to ask questions, and then we'll make sure to pause and elevate those questions as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about who we are at MoneyThink. Um, MoneyThink is the organization that essentially manages Decided, which is the tool that we run. So MoneyThink is, a, is a, essentially a college access and success nonprofit that's been around for about 15 years. So we started in 2008 doing really direct coaching work on the ground with students around financial aid, around college affordability, and these themes that we'll talk about today. Um, so that work on the ground for almost you know, 10 or 11 years informed the, the development of our product Decided, which is a free tool um, to, for students to search for colleges and compare financial aid award letters. Um, so we've been really focused on this question of how to bring those kinds of discussions to scale and decided we built almost four years ago. Um, and that's that tool, both for students and advisors, is our way of bringing that work to scale around affordability and financial literacy for high school students. So I just wanted to ask a quick icebreaker um, in the chat. How comfortable are you with supporting students through the financial aid process? So you can say one for not at all. Two for somewhat, I've been doing this work a little bit, or I'm, I'm somewhat new, but I'm getting my feet, my feet wet. And then three is very. So this would be somebody who's been doing this work for many years and feels really confident talking students through the financial aid process. Okay, awesome. Thanks y'all for engaging in this way. I appreciate it. So I see a lot of two to three range, some twos and a halves. I see a one in there. And then I see a one three in there as well. So it seems like folks have some exposure to these themes of financial aid. There's a couple of folks on either end, but it seems like for the most part, um, the folks on the call have a little bit of exposure, but don't necessarily feel like an expert. Um, so thank you so much for engaging. We'll do a couple of those up just to pulse check um, and get some interactivity. So, you know, as you all know well, there's a lot of steps in the college journey. And I know that you're maybe, what are we, maybe, you know, one quarter or, two, you know, almost halfway there um, for your seniors that you're working with this year. But essentially, you know, the college aid and financial aid applications happened in the fall. You all have that under your belt in many ways. And the next step is really about acceptances and award letters. So in the next couple of months, your students are going to start getting those award letters in. 
And this is really the bread and butter of the work that Money Think is supporting. Um, we encourage all families, students, and educators that are supporting students to really make thoughtful comparisons of those letters because it can be pretty tempting to get something that's really exciting or to get a letter from your dream school and not look at all the offers that you have. But at, here at Money Think, we really encourage students and the adults that are supporting them to look at each one of those letters to make sure that they're interpreting them and understanding what they say, because it can be kind of complicated, as we all know. Um, and the next step would be to compare options and enroll. So we're really in between step two and three here, and this will be really where our work sits today and the discussion that we have. So the college affordability problem, I want to talk a little bit about, about this with you all. Again, I know that I know that you're steeping in this in many ways, but you know, enrolling in a college with sustainable financial planning is really important. Um, so comp you know, we all agree that completing a college degree pays off, but how to afford it, you know, that question is, is challenging. And it's particularly challenging when students are navigating this process alone. So MoneyThink has built all of our tools really aimed at first gen and low income students so that they have the resources that they need with the families and caregivers that are supporting them to make this really important decision. Um, the other thing is that we know that these college attainment disparities, so who completes college, there's, there's very big disparities in there, right? So for traditionally marginalized, low-income, and first-gen students, that likelihood is, is lower often. And a part of that is actual financial burden and, and debt. So, you know, here at Money Think, what we've found in our work is that there's, there's a high chance of stopping out due to financial hardship, right? This is a lot of the data is talking about this. And this is in large part because college cost information is incredibly hard to get. Um, it's sent to a portal, it's sent to your snail mail, it's sent to your Gmail maybe, but often it's pretty difficult to understand and compare. And then in many ways, some of these letters can be at times almost inherently misleading. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So one of the things that, you know, one of the data points that's out there is that each year about 2 million students stop out due to financial hardship, and they carry about an average of $10,000 in debt. So Imagine being a student who has $10,000 in debt, you still don't have a degree or credential to show for it, and you don't have that ability to enter the workforce at a, at a family sustaining wage It's something that's going to allow you to pay that off. So this, this is really the problem that we're aimed at solving here at MoneyThink is that students are deserve the right to go to an affordable college and they need really transparent, accurate, timely information to be able to do that and make that decision effectively. So, you know, research shows that 70% of students who do stop out are citing those financial reasons. Um, and we know that, you know, counselors and advisors are on the front lines, right? Like you all have unrealistic caseloads. You have students with varied needs, right? Especially right now with the way that mental health and COVID and all of the things that young adolescents are up against. Um, so we know that those, those caseloads can make it incredibly challenging to meet every one of your students' needs and that y'all are doing amazing work with often pretty limited resources in the public school system. Um, so I think one of the things that we've noticed here is that, you know, it can be really hard to reach all of those students, and it can be really hard for those students to get the resources they need. So I decided at Money Think we really are focused on building ed tech tools that kind of grow your ability to meet more students need with the same amount of time that you have in a quicker way. So the big crux of our work focuses on the financial aid award letter. Um, so as we talked about before, financial aid information and cost information in general is highly layered, super complicated. Um, one of the things that we've found in our data and other folks have found in their data is that about 30% of awards don't include any cost. So that means that a student could get a letter saying, you know, you're getting $20,000 in grants and scholarships, but without knowing that the school is actually going to cost them over 50000 how useful is that, right? And many, many letters aren't actually including any cost information, which is, in, is not in line with the best practices that the federal government has put out. The other thing is that 70% of letters that students are receiving are grouping all aid together. So they're essentially not explaining the difference between that free money through grants and scholarships and the money that students have to pay back through loans and work study. So grants and scholarships are free money that's guaranteed with no payback loans and work study are not guaranteed. They often have um, contingencies based on a placement and high vari or variable interest rates. So, you know, this is especially problematic for students because some of this money is available before you start school, some after. So we know that for many folks on the ground who are learning financial aid through the work experience that you're having, there's really no clear delineation of a lot of this data and it's really hard to access and know which sources to trust. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about a letter that we've actually seen in our work and highlight some of the, the nuances here. So you can see that this student has been given a package where it looks like they have about 64,000 in total aid. This letter is also telling them they have about 6,000 in estimated amount due. Um, so presenting this total aid awarded as, as, as aid, right, is incredibly misleading just right off the bat. Um, a bulk, a large bulk of this, this aid awarded is actually unsubsidized student loans and parent plus loans. So it's not telling the student actually about $40,000 of this, you and your parents are going to have to pay back at very high interest rates that start the second that you start college. Um, you know, the other thing is that, that this, this letter is also bucketing certain things in very confusing ways. So you can see that the federal student loans that they've got outlined here, they're, they're never totaling costs. You can see that this includes almost $40,000 worth of loans. And you can also see that the estimated amount due leaves out really important costs that are non-negotiable, such as housing and just personal expenses. So this letter is making it seem like to the student, you're only gonna owe $6,000, but assuming that the student won't need to have any housing costs, which every student has a housing cost and a personal expense cost for life budget, no matter where they're living. So $28,000 of this is truly covered in grants and scholarships, which leaves a gap of about $35,000. So this is the decision, this is the information that this student needs, right? There's a gap of $35,000 here. If you attend and accept this package, you'll be on the line and your parents will be on the line for paying that back. So this is a letter that students are actually receiving right now. Um, and this is really some of the problem that we're trying to solve with Decided, where we're giving students information in transparent ways that allows them to compare these confusing offer letters apples to apples, put them side by side, and really have a clear sense of that free money versus that money that they'll have to pay back. So I wanted to pause and I saw, Kelly, thank you for your comment. It is so wrong. I mean, this is one that's particularly glaring, but this is actually pretty common, These this aid being awarded in this way. And I think for many students, especially first gen students, it can be really intimidating to know how to pull this all apart. Some of these shocking things that we're finding is really what drives our mission and our work, right? Because we work directly with students and through our financial literacy, that was the main question that was coming up is how do we afford college? And then the confusion that students go through. Um, as you'll see in the visual, uh, part of what we've built in is to also make sure that it communicates to the student. Uh, we'll get more into that. And I just want to quickly just define um, college affordability, right? Through our years of working with students directly, we want to make sure that we're providing transparent information around one of the biggest financial decisions students and families willing to make, right? And the previous offer letter we wrote together highlighted those difficulties that students have to review and have competencies in, right? Not even that, um, they have to have competencies in to deciphering the award letter uh, from all the colleges um, and the different formats, the languages that they're using, the structures that are different across these colleges. So at MoneyThink, to help support this, uh, we've came up with our own methodology that was also steeped within the best practices in the space to define what is that gap that we we're talking about that makes it affordable, that can be feasible for students and families, especially when we're thinking about first gen or low income students. So within that gap, we include what Hannah just mentioned, making sure that your coverage includes the tuition, the direct costs, and direct costs is including your housing and your meals. Uh, so to be flagged as an affordable, a student should be able to cover any of the remaining costs outside of uh, after you reduce the gift aid, so all the free money and the grants and scholarships have been paid, the remaining gap should be less than 7500 With that 7500 the student is able to plan to cover that gap by taking no more than the 5500 in federal subsidized and unsub loans and working 10 hours or less during the school year. So that 5500 is our threshold that we're suggesting students don't go over. Obviously, we want to make sure we encourage students to take less and as, as less as they can. Um, that threshold also means that is what they can access on their own. Anything additional, additional, usually that means that they have to apply for more, they have to have credit scores, they have to have parents taking out loans, and that's not something that's viable for all of our students and all of our families um, in their circumstances. So we consider a school with a gap of between 7500 and 11500 somewhat affordable as it will be breaking one of our recommendations and guidance. So again, Based on everyone's fa uh, financial circumstance, these numbers could look a little different, but this is our general recommendation to make sure that you're taking on an affordable amount of debt that is not going to take you um, into crippling debt, right? So anything that's beyond the 11500 essentially the students are going to be breaking both of our guidance. They're either going to be taking more in loans and also working way more in 
uh, and work hours as well. So taking large amounts of loans, we already know that it's risky due to having high monthly payments when paying them back. It also raises the risk of defaulting, which we've seen happen in the previous years, previous years as well. And then working over 20 plus hours, which we know some of our students are doing, also has detrimental impact to their success in the classroom, could lead to them stopping out because they're working to live. And then on top of that, they're not being in the classroom successful. Um, also, what most students are recognized and some of our families don't understand is that if you're working 20 plus hours, 30 plus hours, you're also missing a lot of the intangibles that college offers you, right? So it's not only the academics, but also the networking um, that you can get within that, connecting with your professors, uh, getting your internships that you need to jumpstart your career. All that kind of goes out the window if you're always working 20 to 30 hours and just making it in time to sit in a class. So now saying that, what is an affordable college? So an affordable college can vary enormously, right? So we can define the thresholds, but there's no easy way for students and families to differentiate between the affordable quality college versus, versus the expensive schools with poor outcomes. Um, to have a holistic approach in identifying the high quality affordable colleges, each student will need to make sure to compare their financial aid offers from the schools that they've sent up to them, along with the important fit factors that considers graduation rates, uh, earning potentials, diversity, and programs offered, as all these things are the intangibles that will determine the success of the student, but also how comfortable are they going to be on that campus to thrive. Uh, in the end, the goal is to find the right school that matches the needs of the student with affordability in mind. As similar students who may be applying to that same college may end up getting different financial aid offers. Um, and I've seen this with a lot of students as well who will assume, I know a friend that went to that college, they got a good amount of money, so I will automatically get that. That's not always the case. So we want to make sure we're making our students and families just more savvy um, consumers of education, understanding, and really making sure they're looking and comparing at all the things to make sure that they're finding the right fit for them. And that might end up not being the dream school they first thought that they wanted to go to as well. Um, so a lot of this findings that we just went through, um, our beginnings and what we've developed with and decided is really just introduce you to this tool, which is a free tool for students and for the advisors who are supporting them. Um, and the goal for us as a mission oriented organization is to provide that equity in the information and transparency. So Decided for students, what does it do at a high level before we get into uh, the actual demo? Decided for students helps students compare their colleges, confirm their costs, and then choose confidently. They can do this by early in their process in the fall. They can search, filter, compare, order their college list. Uh, so we have some juniors also on our platform who are exploring and thinking about this. But it really kicks into gear when once they get their acceptances, when they're able to upload the financial award letters for automatic translation and see the affordability ratings. Then from there, they're able to review and compare the award letters across all of their options, uh, see the estimated net cost and affordability before confirming their enrollment status. And a lot of the design that we've committed to is really from feedback from students. Um, so it's not necessarily that you as advisors are not always going through and talking to, with students about all these numbers, but it's how they're seeing and interpreting the information, which we'll tell you from our partner feedback as well. So a lot of it is just making sure the information is easily digestible and understandable to the students so they can make those choices confidently. And then for the advisor side, uh, it's an accompanying uh, web app as well that allows you to have more holistic enrollment decision support with a four billion mind. So then that way you can review your student progress uh, the colleges they've added, the award letters they've uploaded, the financial aid results that they're getting, uh, and then also communicate with them and download reports so then you can have more analysis for your programming years as well. Okay. So John, we so, have a question from Natalie. Um, do you have a written list of your guidelines? Um, so I think Natalie may be like the methodology I'm thinking. Speak to the, I think Natalie, I believe that means kind of like the guidelines for affordability, sort of how we've bucketed out those rankings. John, do you want to speak a little bit to how we design that methodology in the cutoffs? Yeah, so a lot of that is also used from US buyers research that they've done in the past within thresholds. Within that, we've done our own version to make it a little more conservative, but all that also is going to be on our website in the FAQs to showcase that. Um, but the methodology is coming from the research within the space and the conservative part that we put in is we're not including certain things um, where it's putting more of an onus on the student family. So we're just making it more rigid. It's what is that the student is able to afford by themselves? What are the resources they can attain and utilize uh, to afford college? So anything beyond that, that they can get support from family or others, it's going to help support them to pay those education. But what can they do on their own? That's a safe amount. Uh, we also use within our statistics, um, 
the labor information from um, national databases to make sure that the you know earning potentials match up with what decision students are making within the platform based on affordability factors. Thank you. Great question. Okay, I will get into our web app now. All right. So um, again, this is on our website, decide.org. Students and advisors can come here to create their free account. Um, I'm going to jump into the student account to showcase what students will first see. So once they create their account, all they need is their email and name to get started. Uh, they'll be able to search and add the schools that they're looking for. If they're a junior and want to explore, they can explore schools through different variations. So based on location, based on the majors that they're interested in, uh, and the type of schools to help further filter that list down. But once they already have their college list happening, um, you can see some of the um, process that I have in this phase right here. Some of these colleges have already uploaded an award letter, if I've selected enrollment, or if I'm just interested in a school. Um, once students add more options, they'll be able to actually compare and see some of the information. So I picked Boise State, just so we can just see what the information that is loaded on there currently. What we will show students first right away is their direct uh, their direct cost, which will be the for college bill. So that means the tuition, things that are going to be due to the school. And then we're also going to make sure to include a life budget. A life budget for us is all the personal expenses, books, and other items that are included. Um, some colleges do a good job in making sure that they are showcasing these numbers, but not all of them showcase them or kind of make it really difficult to find that information. When that is the case, we give them uh, conservative estimate amounts that they can use to help them budget and plan accordingly. Because uh, that is something we've seen in the past where students, if they're only shown the college bill, they think that's all they have to pay and that's all they should cover. And then when they arrive on campus, the unexpected cost of you know paying for their personal expenses, paying for transportation uh, and books that are coming up that they're not aware of. So outside of seeing that at a high level, they'll be able to see it broken down. And um, we use the data uh, when it's updated from iPads as well uh, to the most current one that we can get to make sure that students are aware of what those costs are. Uh, from there, we also pull graduation rates. And more specifically, if a student wants to see a graduation rate for students like them or that identify as them, they can change their ethnicity. They're not required to put ethnicity or zip code. Uh, so every time they're putting this information, we just give them more personalized data information. So based on my entry right here, I have my zip code in there. I have my ethnicity. So if a school has enough of a data point, they'll give that specific ethnicity. If there's not enough students of that ethnicity, they will go to the larger group, students of color. Um, so as you can see right now, it's showing the four-year grad rate for this institution. Um, same with earning potentials. Uh, it'll show you what the six years after starting college earn, median earnings for those students are. Um, I know we will be trying to work to see if we can identify even more within the major or certain fields, but right now this is just the general college earning potential. Same with diversity and, um, and financial aid received. So these were important factors that were actually um, asked by students for feedback, right? So they want to make sure that they can have that sense of belonging. And part of that sense of belonging is knowing who's on campus and can they vision themselves being on that institution. Um, and the interesting fact about this is that for some colleges, students were hesitant to apply to, they had misassumptions. They didn't think there was other students that were like them on campus. So they were almost going to be to the point where they were not going to apply. So this can also double down in making sure to enforce for students if they are looking for certain institutions to not overlook others, right? Uh, until they know the information and they find out all the information that they need. And then lastly, another request that was made by students is they like the aspect they can see the distance. Um, and this, this is a great conversation point for a lot of students that say that maybe they want to go out of state. Do you really want to go out of state? And are you able to commit? Because that's far away from home. There's commute that's going to happen. You may not be able to come back home as often. Um, or if it's somewhere close, but it's only like it's a 40 minute commute for some of our students that live in SF, but are thinking about going to San Jose, commuting every day is not ideal when you look at it in the map. It may seem like it's nearby that it's close by, but there are other things that uh, need to be accounted for as well. And then below, students will get guides that they will be uh, highlighted depending where they're at, at different processes of the stage for their universities while they're exploring it. Um, we have about 22 different guides that walk students through different uh, touch points of their college journey. Now, the biggest part is once students already um, have added their colleges, they've been applied to your, they've applied to their colleges, they've accepted, they can change these. Once they upload their award letter, it will automatically update to that current status. Now, what I want to show you is what an award letter looked like. So 
a student can take a screenshot of the award letters they receive um, from their college portal or from the emails that they get. When Once they upload it, what our data then uh, OCR tool, the uh, optical character recognition tool does then is scrape the information quickly to let them know of all the data that's in there, what is the free college scholarships that they're getting and grants. And that will be replicated on the right side so they can double check it. Um, and so as you can see over here, none of the and none of the loans would be included. This specific one didn't have a loan, but we have other uh, award letters where they might have loans on there. And we will let the students know that we're only taking into account the grants and scholarships that they are being offered. Same with work study. Advisors can view the work study and the loans when they download uh, reports, but the students will just see the grants and scholarships so they can first do the comparison from that point of view. Yes, students can upload the JPEG, PNG, or PDF to up, um, within our system. So those would be the preferred formats. We've had students sometimes take a screenshot with their phone of the screen. Um, sometimes our system will recognize that and work it, but it's ideal for them to just do it with JPEG or a PNG uh, so that the data can work more seamlessly. Um, and if they do it in that format, usually it can run between five seconds to 10 seconds max to get the information. For most schools and most formats that we cover, that's how long it takes. If for some reason it's a brand new format or maybe a written out type of award letter that's been uh, uploaded, that's where we may have to have one of our own people review it and make sure that the data is correct and then train our system to try and recognize that format moving forward. Any other questions for John before we keep it moving here and show you some other elements? Raise your hand and then we can, end. yep. Yeah, hey, um, I've got a student that's gonna be receiving in-state tuition from an out-of-state university, how do they uh, report that in this situation or on decided? Um, great question. So if they know for sure that it's full in-state tuition, because sometimes I know it's reduced, which is a little different, the reduced one will be a little bit harder. But if it's in-state tuition, what I would suggest for them to do is if they can go in here and they can edit their zip code, um, they'll then we'll match up the in-state tuition costs. Thank you. Yep. And that's a good, good question. So as you can see, since I have an out-of-state zip code, I'm getting the out-of-state tuition. Um, so for those students who are looking for out-of-state colleges, we're going to make sure that they're seeing the out-of-state tuition uh, so that they keep that top of mind. Um, now, once they get into compare view, which is when they have multiple schools, multiple award letters is where we'd like students to be. Because uh, what we've seen is once students upload like their second and third award letter, then they're starting to understand the power of comparing, right? And the power of like looking through all their options. Usually if they have that one award letter and it's from their dream school, the hard part is getting them to think about the other options as well to compare it and contrast. Uh, so if you can get into the point of uploading multiple award letters, the conversations will become much more uh, deeper, but also much more thoughtful and, and engaging with them, right? Because now if, when a student sees this, uh, for a lot of our advisors, what they've said is it might have been a dream school, but once they see that red ring, they're just saying, yeah, now I get what you mean. That's not going to be a school that I'm going to probably consider because that's going to stretch my pocket and my family's pocket. So I'm going to start considering looking at the other schools that are maybe in the green, maybe in the orange, if I already have some savings um, available or I'm getting money from somewhere else. Uh, but this is where they can look through and try to make a holistic decision based on the affordability. What is the out-of-pocket cost that they're going to be expected to pay? But then they can also compare that and contrast that with the success factors that are important to them, right? For some of our students, it is that they want to graduate as soon as possible. So they want to try and get close to four years. So looking at that four-year grad rate can be very important for them as well if they know it's an affordable institution. So for example, uh, for this student right now, uh, UC Irvine has got the highest graduation rate, but I think Madison's got the lowest out of pocket potentially or tied with the University of uh, Irvine. So they can compare those two. They can also look at the earning potentials, right? Because that's a little distinction as well. Is the institution I'm going to go to, are they typically uh, supporting their students to have higher earning potentials or their, uh, through their career services? That might be something we want to look at. Or diversity is really important for some students, right? We know some students want to go to HBCU or HSI institutions uh, for that community feel. So having them look at that, but then contrast that with all the other factors is important. This is not to say that we're telling students that they can't go to certain schools, but it is to keep them wide-eyed open so that when they're arriving on campus, they know exactly what to expect. Uh, a lot of our learning came from supporting students who actually arrive on campus and then get shocked by that first bill. And then it's a choice of, do I just stop right there and just go back home? Or do I just take on that huge amount of loan 
And I keep doing that, right? So we want to make sure students know exactly what they're getting into along with their families, because that's the other important factor is how do we encourage families to be part of this conversation? Uh, and that's part of elevating this information to the student and to the family so that they're better prepared for their next action steps. Hey, John, too, we had a couple questions. So um, Sarah, it's awesome to hear you're trying to create an account. Sarah says, after I've confirmed the link, I go to log in and it just says request a new link. Do you have any, John is our web app extraordinaire, so I'll let him answer that need one. to, uh, first, so if you're doing advisor one, when, once you're, well, I can't log in back to the advisor one. Okay. Um, you would just create, make sure you're creating an account, not logging in. And then once you've done that, it should be a confirmation link given to you in your email. So make sure it's coming from support at decided.org. Maybe went to your spam folder, but once you click that, it confirms through your authorization. I would suggest doing Google uh, sign on. That makes it easier because it does the authorization right away. But Sarah, feel free to message, you know, you and I can message offline if um, I did got, I got that click to confirm email and it goes straight to the link again. So yeah, let, I'll message you offline, Sarah, and we can troubleshoot. And then we had another question just about the zip code that I thought was a good one. I, I think it disappeared, but the zip code, John, can you talk a little bit about where we use that? Because that doesn't, that, you know, if students, that's an optional field that if students enter, essentially, you know, it'll inform a couple different places, but I'll let John speak to that. Yeah, so when students create their account, all that we require from them is their email and name first. Um, again, because we got feedback from students that they don't want to give much information unless they know the value for it. So if they don't put their zip code in the beginning of creating their account, they can come back in their account over here to edit their profile. They can change out the zip code and that will change um, uh, their affordability level and different um, outcomes that they get in here as well. Same with this ethnicity. Uh, I know we got feedback from students that it would be nice for them to pick multiple, but currently we're only able to pull out the data from the national statistics based on these categories, but they're able to swap and move this around as well. And you'll see that'll change certain graduation rates. So if I select a new ethnicity, uh, graduation rates may potentially change a little bit differently for some, and for some schools, they may stay the same uh, depending on what that's happening in that area. And some, and some institutions, they may not have enough student representation within that ethnicity. So that's why we'll go to students of color rather than that specific ethnicity as well. Does that cover that part, Hannah? I think you're good. Yep. Thanks, John. Okay. Um, and then lastly, before I switch over to the advisor one, there will be multiple ways that students can connect with your programs or you as an advisor. One way is if they, if you give them an organization code, they can join the organization account, the dashboard. They also get to leave when they want. So again, we want to make sure we're giving um, control to students for their data. So they are opting in to essentially share that information with you and collaborate with you. So if at any moment they want to leave, they can click to leave. And therefore, then you won't be able to see their uh, viewing rights of their information, but they can come just back on right away as well. All right. And then I'm going to switch to the advisor side now. Um, for those who create an advisor, the first time you log in, you'll see a blank uh, template over here. But essentially, there's main actions that you can do as we try to make it as close to like spreadsheet format like. So as you can see, we have two big areas for all for students and then for the advisor side. So if you are the admin um, on the account, you'll be able to manage your team. That means your team members who are going to be working with your students here uh, by inviting them and organizing them to the list as you need to. Same way you would do with students. Um, so that's your your two big platform areas where you see the information. Now, when it comes to onboarding your students or your advisors, you can send invites by clicking the top button and selecting either the students or um, the advisors you want to invite. You can drop in as many emails, just copying and pasting, and then you can assign them an advisor if you have that specific advisor you want them to be assigned to. Um, and then once they accept, you'll see them in here. If that invitation expires after a certain amount of time, uh, I think it's 30 days, you can resend. You can... So you can click the actions to do a resend or delete those invites as needed. That would be the same process when it comes to advisors as well. You can invite your team members. You can see if they've accepted or if those invitations have expired. You can change their roles if you're an admin as well. Um, if you need to edit their role specifically, you can take the action steps to do that or resend the invites. Um, now, once you have students on your platform, uh, you can click into that specific student to see that compare view that I was just showing you, walking you through. Again, you're not going to be able to edit their choices and their list. So you can uh, send messages to students to let them know to prioritize, you know, the first two, three 
top of their list, their favorite colleges, so that you're aware of what they're really looking at. Um, after they've uploaded an award letter, you have the choice of downloading the actual award letter to view it for yourself. This might be helpful for um, more follow-up conversations if they've already selected where they're going to enroll and you want to talk through how much amount of the loans are going to take out, what are they going to do with work study, and next steps that they might have to take. That's where downloading the actual award letter itself may be helpful for advisors. Um, now, for an advisor, you can also take notes. So maybe you want to take notes on that student. Um, and if you're working with a team, you can make sure it's shared to all the advisors. So therefore, if you're not there and someone else is continuing the conversation, they can get that information and continue that conversation thread with them. Um, lastly, I want to also just make sure that although we're showing four year institutions currently, we do have two years on the platform. Um, our best practice guidance usually is for a lot of programs that are working through this is making sure students are looking at their four year option. But then if they are opting out to two years, that that conversation flow can still come um, happen through decided as needed. Now, outside of just being able to filter and look through affordability at the high level here, seeing the last activity, the signed advisors, uh, the next steps that advisors can take is making sure that they can create their own list. Uh, so if I'm an advisor and I want to only look at these students, I can create a list with those students. So maybe if you're an institution at a high school that's got 400 students and there's five of you, uh, each of you is taking a caseload of 100, you can create your own list off of that. Um, or you can send messages. So you want to send a message to all your students, you can select them all, send a notification, let them know to go check for their award letters, or specifically those students as needed, or maybe you want to just export the data. So you can select all the students' data that you want to export uh, for your own review and your team's review. Um, now, when you're creating lists, you can create a list that is just for yourself. So that means no one else sees it other than you, um, or you can share it with specific uh, team members or share it with your whole organization. What that will look like is if it's for yourself, these are my current list that's just viewable to me versus shared list, whether I created or, some, or my team member created, the whole organization can see that as well. So John, I had, we have a question from Carrie, a really good question, and I'm going to just kind of give you a minute to read through it, but I, I'm curious your perspective on this. So Carrie uploaded a letter from the Wisconsin. Um, it says, you know, the app is saying that there's a different cost for tuition um, and meals, right? So then Carrie noted that at the end, we say there's a, this is an estimate for the actual 2021 school year. So can you talk a little bit about the difference between the cost on the letter versus the cost that we're showing in Decided? Yeah, so the cost that we're going to show from Decided where we've pulled from the iPads data, that's to get to the comparison part, right? So the biggest component right now is um, is looking at the choices you're going to make. So the average cost of the room and board, those will vary. So it depends what the student does. Um, so within that, we actually have more of our guides that talk about that and how to think through. Let me pull up our guides so that we can see it. How to think through uh, about your college bill or your, your life budget. Um, those get more detailed. And so we really want to just focus on students looking at the big number at the start because um, it can get overwhelming looking at all the options that the schools are going to give you in your single, your quad, your triple rooms, and then your meal plans to try and figure out the exact number. So it's more of what is the general gap that you need to look at so you can compare, make your choices. Then you get to the more of the financial planning for the specific institutions that you're going to go into. Um, well, that's what Carrie, Carrie. So Carrie uploaded the letter and that's what I think the question yeah. is, is, it looks like, so we don't actually pull the costs from the mm -hmm. financial aid award letter and just want to make sure that's really clear to folks. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we won't pull the, the cost because sometimes they'll have certain choices that students can be making uh, that are not included on there. So we want them to be mindful of the general big cost in comparison, correct? And also, as we mentioned, 30 to 40% of letters don't include any cost information. Yep. So decided couldn't, on the back end, we can't really build an algorithm to collect that data and use it exclusively. We need a different data source carry too, because if we have 30, 40% of letters not including that cost information, we can't tell the platform to just always pull that from the letter. We have to have a different data source that we juxtapose that data with. So that's why we use the iPads data from that school year um, just prior. So it's a it's it's a slightly imperfect method, but again, it, it really does, it really is about understanding that difference between the free money and the money that students will have to pay back. So that estimate typically provides a good um, grain size for that kind of comparison. But feel free to ping me on the side or email, and we're happy to dig in um, deeper and kind of make sure that, that that question is answered. But it's a very good example. Yeah. Uh, with that note, though, I will just say that I, I believe our data team is looking to, when we look at the data, we still take that information. And the hope is down the road is if it's viable enough where we can update it 
But right now it's just so inconsistent with not all schools showing that in their war letters that we don't take that route. But it is information we are watching and just seeing how often they're changing. Any other questions on the dashboard before I go back to the slide deck? I just want to confirm, this is free for students and advisors to use, correct? Correct. That is correct. That is a big question that we get because usually people are hesitant for that. Yes, it is free for you to just create your account, just like as you've seen someone within the chat already. You can go ahead and create the account today. You can add your team members. You can add students. And then you can also feel free to reach out to us to for help support on implementation and best practices as well. Yeah, I also wanted to highlight, so, you know, the, the tool itself is free, but we also do provide free training. So if you feel like I have a group of counselors at my school and I want to get them onboarded into this, you know, John and I would be happy to talk after the session. Feel free to email us. We're happy to set up a more deep dive training. This is like very high level, and I know we have about 14 minutes left, so I know it's not going to feel like you're able to digest it. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for sending some of those follow-up resources in the chat. We do have an onboarding toolkit for advisors, and then you can, and then some more details on how to get your students on. Um, but if you need more support, you know, we're happy to provide that and give your team um, a deeper dive into this training so that we can really contextualize it with your students and educators. All right, just to get us moving to the next part of it, I uh, just wanted to give you some testimonials of what use case uh, uh, Decide has been for students. So for a lot of our students are telling us, um, you know, knowing how much aid you're getting, how much you're paying and how affordable is going to be, it is relieving for a lot of them because there's a lot of stress that's built up, right? You're going through this hard process of applying for colleges, not knowing if it's going to be affordable or not, and then getting the validation of like, yes, I can make this work is relieving for a lot of our students. Um, so yeah, just wanted to highlight that aspect. And then just from a high overview, a couple of things that students can be doing if you want to use this tool as part of your work process through their college journey is, especially if it's juniors or their senior year coming up, they can be researching and explore, exploring those uh, information that we provide within the platform. Uh, from there, they can start tracking their progress and you'll be able to see them in their trajectory, right? From adding colleges to applying to then getting accepted, uploading, and then enrolling. Um, they can then finally get to the aspect of once they've uploaded their award letters, really comparing their options with all the information right in front of them from the financial side, but also some of those fit factors that we were pointing out within the tool. Um, and then the guys are there to help them dig a little bit deeper and get a little more contextual information based on their choices that they're at in that point. So some of the guys will reference also for a lot of our students that you need to be aware of health insurance fees that colleges um uh, put on for you, right? So for some families, it may mean that you can actually fill a waiver and that's $2,000 in savings right there. For some students, if you select your housing early and you get the uh, quad, you're gonna save an additional 1,000 to 2,000 instead of the single dormitory. So there's a lot of little hidden costs that are also, um, that students need to be mindful and we can cover that more within the guides. And so again, some of those guides categories will be cost of attendance. So uh, looking at housing, tuition, those costs, and then types of financial aid that students need to be aware of. Uh, so getting ready for their admission essay to financial aid, uh, FAFSA, uh, things they need to know about scholarships, especially if uh, they're going to be in states where their scholarship displacement, how do they go around that? Thinking about that as well, work study and working on campus, as well as having communication with their family about money, which is an important topic, right? So that everyone's aware of what is expected and what they will receive um, and making sure they can afford the institutions they select. And then again, around affordability and fit, that can be around the campus environment. So that sense of belonging through diversity, the graduation rate through success rate as well, and then navigating the process. Some of our students will be flagged for verifications, making sure they know what they need to do, the action steps they need to take, um, finding their financial award letter. And then more importantly, for some of our students, uh, knowing that they can appeal financial aid. Not a lot of our families know that, right? So there's different reasons why to they should appeal for more money. Um, and we kind of talk through that process, but also give them a reference to SWIFT student, which helps them set up templates of um, what they can send to their financial aid office to start that process as well. And then finally, too, within the guides, it's really just talking about loans. Uh, the variety of loans, which ones we recommend, which ones we are recommending students avoid. So we are telling students to avoid the private loans uh, and really try and stick to the federal sub and unsub loans uh, as much as they can. And then also gauging how much is too much loan, because we know that some of our students that go to STEM related fields will have higher earning potentials so that may look a little different for them, especially if they have to take five years to do an engineering program. 
Um, and then there's also the ultimate guide to loans that can be really useful to your parents and caregivers as you're thinking through this or advisors who want to learn a little more on that perspective. I want to open it up to some Q&A now. Feel free to unmute yourself or just throw in the chat or the Q&A any questions that are coming up. Um, While we're waiting for those questions, I just want to thank you guys so much for sharing this information. Um, and thank you to Money Think in general for creating such a powerful and necessary tool. Um, like I said in the beginning, I went to that conference. And again, please put questions in the chat right now. I'm just giving you filler. Um, when I went to that conference, I came back and I actually kind of brought up this issue of award letter obfuscation to leadership here at the board. Um, and last month, the brilliant and much better, well-informed um, people and experts that I work with actually initiated an investigation into the kind of letters and vocabulary that we are sending out um, from Idaho public institutions. So soon we will be in a position to uh, evaluate opportunities for optimization if, if necessary. So exciting developments. Outside of federal legislation that, temp, you know, essentially the federal government is moving towards a template that all colleges have to use. But, um, but in the meantime, it is up to states and the institutions within those states to kind of advocate. So awesome work from, from our end. And I, you know, we're trying to solve this problem, but we hope we work ourselves out of a job because um, colleges are, are really creating clearer transparency on this. So I just, we have, we're just about to close out, you know, before we do, um, Oh, and Anna, I just see a question. So if you say cost can't be represented exactly for the student, how would you counsel a student as to the cushion represented or not represented? That is a good question. John, I'm curious your thoughts on this one. Is that the, the life budget, Anna? I wanna make sure that I'm tracking the question. And thank you. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but would love your thoughts. Um, you just said that cost can't be represented exactly based on what you're receiving from the universities. So obviously the number represented on um, decided has some grace. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to counsel the student to say, this could be $500 difference, or this could be, like you said, the quad versus the single. Yep. You know, they're trying to make a decision from this tool, but it's obviously not an exact science. So it's trying to figure out how much grace there is, you know? Yeah in their uh, bottom line. Yeah, great question. So part of the way we do the numbers is to give them more of a conservative estimate, meaning that if they're budgeting close to what we're already giving them, they can fly underneath it. Uh, so a lot of what we've seen with students, I think with one of the slides coming up further, is actually because they are looking at the closer budget that we're giving them, they end up going to school and then they're reading the guides about how they can cut costs and their personal expenses and textbooks and other areas. And they come back and telling us, actually, I over budgeted, so I had enough left. I it was less stressful for me. So that's kind of what we want to get to. We don't want to try and pigeonhole it where it's every dollar that if you're on there, that's the only way you make it. But more of if you can get to this higher threshold and you have budgeted for that, there's a wiggle room going down. And that's where our guides come in. Like your personal expenses, you can reduce that. For myself, uh, first year college when I went in there, I spent a thousand two hundred first semester on books. I didn't know any better. I bought the new books. So by the end of the year, I spent 2000 plus on books. My uh, classmates next to me spent $200. That's a huge saving that I didn't know I could have done. Um, but yeah, so those are some of the examples. But a lot of that is the conversations that advisors will have. Some of it will be, can be guided through our guides as talking points. Um, but yeah, and then others will be the decisions they make in their quads. Again, some of those are still covered in our guides. So that's more of a deeper dive once they're in that phase. Perfect especially for the first gen and the low incomes, it's like every dollar matters, yep. but it's really a critical conversation. Yeah, hundred percent. Thank you. It's a really good question. Um, you know, John, I think because of the time, let's, let's move on. We'll, we're going to talk a little bit about some of our partner data. We just wanted to close out with a partner spotlight um, of some folks that are using the tool at College Track Sacramento. Um, so one of the, you know, a couple of the things that they've highlighted there is this early and often student access. So they used to have a lot of spreadsheets. They used to have a lot of different systems that they use. They're now using this tool to do all of the exploration piece and then all of the enrollment decision comparison piece. So they're using it as a college discovery tool in addition to that affordability tool. Um, and they're utilizing it with actually 9th, 10th and 11th grade students um, so that they can actually kind of see some of their shifting college interests and priorities over the years. Um, and then, you know, in many ways, they're using the advisor dashboard in juxtaposition with the student facing side. 
And this is giving them some really meaty data to work with. So I know that y'all have different reporting metrics, whether that's for the state, for school leadership, for your own just goal setting and for your own um, progress with certain students, right? So some of the data that you can get, this is some of the example data that College Track Sacramento is able to get. They're able to see the kinds of packages their students are getting, right? They're working with, I think about 30 students um, across this cohort. So they're able to see how many of those students are getting the sub federal subsidized loan, what those average amounts are, what certain grants are. They're working with, um, they can also see state grants and institutional grants. So it gives you a really interesting aggregate snapshot of some of those different packages and it helps you tell a more complete story. It also helps you identify which students you need to have an intervention with now. So by looking at the aggregate, you can drill down to that student level in the dashboard, pull those reports, see which students are, for example, favoriting not affordable colleges. It allows you in you know, March or April to pull those students in and say, it looks like you favorited this school, but you have a full ride over here. Let's talk about it. So I just wanted to highlight some of the data, um, you know, that we have available. And I think, you know, the other thing that we've heard is that this has allowed them to move from spreadsheets and calculators to colors and circles and things that students really, really connect with. Um, so all of our tools are built with students in mind. And that visual piece is a really key piece of some of the feedback that we've gotten. Um, so we are going to close out now. We've got a couple of minutes left. Sarah, thank you so much for supporting. And I see you putting some stuff in the chat now. Um, but John, will you just show the contact information slide and we can, we can, um, and, and actually, John, you want to speak a little bit about, that's the QR code to sign up in case you haven't already gotten to our website. So you can go to decided.org or you can scan the QR code directly in this deck. You um, have access to that offline or you can do that here. And then we'll put up our contacts. So John or I are happy to answer questions about trainings, access. Um, Sarah, Wilmore, I want to make sure we connect. So feel free to shoot one of us an email and we're happy to get you um, set up. But and John, anything else you want to say to close this out? Yeah, uh, I believe you'll be getting some um, follow-up collateral that can help for those who are looking to implement it with their school or their programs, uh, especially when you're onboarding students, depending on your school districts, just making sure that there's the allowed list that you need to be mindful of or how you're inviting students. Um, that slide deck will help you think through that, but always feel free to reach out to me uh, to game plan, to think through, or to help you set up, or to just do a demo for you to um, get you a little more comfortable with the tool as well. Perfect. Again, thank you so much, you guys. I'm going to swoop in. I got to share my screen real quick. We want to and encourage your students to follow us on Instagram. It's specifically for them, and it's really easy, passive way to be aware of uh, critical deadlines and cool opportunities. We appreciate your time today, um, and we thank you for everything you do for Idaho students.